So why don't we get started and um, we'll start with you, Jim. Um, and I would like to know kind of what were the challenges that you faced? How did you get your job? Um, the sort of thing that I would like to concentrate on today is the sort of thing we're not going to get from public documents anyplace else that you only have in your head. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of curious for each of you, how did you first learn about the job that you were originally going to take here at what became the National Human Genome Research well, Institute? It, it really started with uh, uh, a phone call from Paul Byrd to me about our forthcoming 1986 symposium. And Paul's suggesting that we have some special session where we talk about the uh, whether to go ahead with the genome project. So that was, uh, I really hadn't thought about it. Bob Sinsemmer had, had a meeting in near Santa Cruz, and uh, one knew that Lee Hood was trying to build a machine to sequence DNA. Uh, uh, but it was really Paul's thing uh, that then I, of course, went to it. And I think I was seeing uh, Wally Gilbert's, you know, one dollar uh, base pair and realized it was only three billion dollars. And that, you know, over 15 years, that wasn't that much percentage of the NIH budget. Uh, and I was already aware of you know, there's several DOE efforts to uh, ha go for the human genome. You know, it was clearly, it could be done. So uh, I didn't want to count on Lee Hood. And so I visualized almost a, a genome city with thousands of technicians, you know, using uh, the old fashioned technology and it could be done. <laughs> it turned out, of course, it didn't go that way. But uh, I did it because I wanted to, I didn't want to be ahead of something that would fail. We could do, the, it was doable, even with the old technology. And uh, so then we clearly had to follow up the coast from Harbor, and there was. Uh, present a very intelligent man named Michael Wotunsky of the McDonald Foundation. And I don't know where he first entered my life, but he came to the symposium. And I immediately thought it, it had to move to the level of the National Academy of Science. That is, we had to have some committee to, in a reasonable way, <laughs> look at it. And Michael said he'd pay for it. So often there's a real problem of finding the money, but we had the money. And then Frank Press, who was president of the National Academy, he was very agreeable to that. And I remember going and talking to Frank about setting up the committee, and uh, I was afraid of uh, opposition from the good scientists. That is, who would see it as a, a you know, Lee Hood had 100 people in his lab <laughs> soon afterwards, and no one wanted to give Lee any more money, because there's just something, you know, that is money to Lee, not to, and uh, so Bruce Alberts had just written a, some opinion piece that you know, no lab should be more than 10 people in size. So I thought he's the person to be in charge of the committee. Because, you know, it, it's a pretty good rule that uh, 10 is a very good size. And uh, so now, you know, people would say 20 because you're expecting it to uh, move past it. But, uh, Bruce was agreeable. Uh, the committee originally, I guess, included probably both. I didn't look it up now. Uh, Lee Hood and Wally. And Wally, soon after the meeting, announced he wanted to start a company. To and the, he had just he had been a starter of Biogen, and it had been at one point it 
chief executive. And uh, wanted to do everything himself, and so they threw him out. I mean, it's head. But he was on the committee, the only woman was, we could think, you know, it was Shirley Tillman. And uh, so, so, so whose idea was it to have a, an academy? Yeah, with enough medical process pe for with this. enough medical people, so that we weren't didn't want to antagonize the human genetics community. So there were two groups. There was a sort of Botstein, Baltimore, the hardcore molecular biologists who were. You know, quite happy with their current science, and weren't driven by medicine. I think probably Paul and I were driven by medicine. You know, as people, mm -hmm. and if you wanted to do your genetics, you had to do that. And uh, uh, so I was basically organized the National Academy Committee and found the funding. I was a member, but uh, that was. Uh, then there was a. So that report comes out in February of 1988, and it comes out no, to I, a kind of a a community that's still a bit in turmoil. There's still opposition. The National Research Council has done a really good job of reframing the project to include mapping and animals beyond the human. Um, and yeah, we, came out with a budget. It was pretty obvious you weren't going to do the human right. first. And but it changed the public dialogue. It made the project seem much more sensible. Um, but one of the looming questions is, is NIH going to lead it, or is the Department of Energy going to lead it, and who is that going to be? Oh, yeah. So enter Jim Watson at that phase. How did that process work? The Academy report comes out. At about the same time that the meeting happens in Reston. The Reston meeting. Yeah, the Reston meeting was important. It was. And I think that was chaired by David Baldwin. I believe you're right. But Weingarten was there. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and Rachel had helped organize and, and that. This is when I first met Jim Watson. No. Okay. Was that meeting? At the Reston meeting. Yeah. I think but, I was really rather quiet at that meeting. You were? But I remember after the meeting ended, Weingarten pulled about <clears throat> four or five of us together. And I guess I was the token sort of junior human genetics person yeah. and said, who could run this project for NIH? And we all agreed there was really only one answer to that, and that was Jim Watson. So Jim came to visit me in Cold Spring Harbor. And, uh, And I didn't say yes, but I didn't raise a lot of objections. So clearly, <laughs> uh, I hadn't ever, even at the time of the rest of the meeting, I didn't think of myself as leading. So it wasn't a hidden agenda. Anyways, uh, I think the key thing was a conversation between Jim and uh, Bob Windham. Bob Windham was the Assistant Secretary of Health and uh, who had been appointed by Reagan. Bob, uh, I think, just totally ignored the illegality of the fact that I was a meeting in Cold Spring Harbor and for the national good just uh, <laughs> appointed me, though I should have, you know, when they fired me, they said, you know, you were illegal, we could have rushed you. <laughs> and uh, that's what they actually said to me. So, the, you know, the sensitivity of government attorneys. So and talk a little bit about that transition from Jim Weingarten approaching you, and then you walk in the door, you do your first public lecture to introduce yourself to the world as the director of this new Office of Human Genome yeah. Research. What's going on behind the scenes in that window and, and between March? Not much, I think, you know, was I think you know, Jim had told me Elka would run the office. So that wasn't my decision. So that's Elka Jordan. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, Mark certainly came in, or came in early. So that's Mark Geyer. And uh, we were over in the old library building to start with. Um, 
My aim at that time was to try and get about 20 genome centers set up. Uh, you know, some mapping, some sequencing. Uh, and uh, so we I think I appointed because he was a friend and uh, at Norton Zinder, sort of the head of the advisory committee. Mm -hmm. In this way, I mean, uh, you know, it was hardcore molecular biology. Norton knew all the people, so there wouldn't be rumors that I that I didn't know about. But and then and Norton, I think Norton. We knew. Because our original operation were our uh, opposition were our friends. So, so <laughs> you walk into an office that doesn't really have budget authority yet. Um, yes. and so I'm an advisor for a year, and then the institute will be set up during that year. And, uh, but it was more or less the to try and have genome money go to as many people who wanted it. And uh, the records would say whether we gave money out to 15 or 20 people. But, you know, there was Cox and Myers in San Francisco before they moved to Stanford. And, uh, there was. I don't know when you came in, Francis. Right at the beginning, yeah. one of the first centers at Michigan. Yeah. One of the first six. So, so I wanted, uh, initially, you know, human genetic centers. I mean, I, w I wanted to have the human genetic community part of the effort. I didn't want to have it as an alternative. And uh, so I think that worked. I don't think there was ever any opposition from the human genetics community. Or not. Uh, so, one thing that we haven't covered is is the Office of Human Genome Research, as it's initially getting started, is a coordination office, and then in '89 it becomes a national center for human yeah. genome research, and actually can spend money yeah. and has a council, and um, that budget is carved out of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, which is having its 50th anniversary this year. Um, we haven't talked about Ruth Kirstein. She was and what's going on in the behind. And wanted it to be controlled by General Medical Sciences. And uh, I only remember her presence at a, a meeting on the Hill. That was our OTA meeting in August of uh, 1987, yeah. where it was about the cost of the genome. This is a meeting that Paul Berg chaired to lay out the budget for what would become the Human Genome Project budget in the chapter of the yeah. OTA report. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and Ruth was at that meeting, Paul was at that meeting, and John Sulston was at that meeting, mm -hmm. among other things. Uh, you know, I had I, I didn't have a personal you know, dislike of her. It, it was that, you know, she wanted to pre preserve her turf. And she had been sort of in charge of genetics with other general medical sciences. And this was creating money that she wasn't going to control. You know, the, it was partly, I, I actually think probably in Ruth's case, it may have, it was perhaps partly in turf, but I actually think. It was also a philosophy of how science should be done with a very strong emphasis on it should be done at the R01 individual Small investigator, science. let it grow up from a thousand flowers. Yeah. And here was a project that was almost being defined as being the opposite of that, of having a goal and having a, a set of objectives and kind of an element of engineering um, but and whiz bang it, high it tech stuff. Be very natural because of the way the Manhattan Project had been organized. That was a big project, and uh, it was led from the top. It wasn't a series of small efforts coalescing. It was 
started from the top and stayed that way. And so, you know, I some things are big and some are small. The genome was big and it wasn't going to be done by an R01. But Ruth eventually came around. Yeah. yeah, actually, to her, very much to her credit, she would talk to my students and basically said, I'm really glad that they didn't follow my advice. <laughs> yes, true. She was, so, she was so, very you know, straightforward so about it, that. It, it wasn't, uh, it was never a, a deep cancer. It, it, it never reoccupied any of my time. You know, it was just, <laughs> Jim had given me the power and uh, that was it. So, uh, did you have any idea how long you'd likely stay? Did you have any sort of plan? No. <laughs> day at a time. So that those crises are hitting at precisely the same time as you're trying to yeah, sure. launch a new federal initiative and yeah, fighting sure. your political battles for so control of the uh, Human Genome Project. And uh, after uh, Bernadine fired me uh, in '92. In '94, I resigned as director and created a new position as a, a president. And I think I'd done that just from you know my observations of how universities function. That you need one, you can't have someone raise money and uh, build buildings, etc., and be a scientific leader. So when you departed in March slash April of 92, um, did it feel like it was the right time to go? No. Uh, but I didn't miss coming down to Washington. <laughs> uh, you know, my evenings when I was down here would be, a lot of them were with Max Collins, who was then scientific director of Howard Hughes, uh, or was Bob Gell, so the, I, which was fun. And uh, Bob, you know, it was just the, the big crisis. Uh, who had found HIV? <laughs> yes. So, uh, and uh, So Jim, can you talk no, a little I, bit? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I think, uh, you know, I, and, and Cold Spring Harbor was always, uh, we had celebrated our 100th anniversary in uh, 1990. And it had built a, a new building which uh, I especially designed a sort of president's office and I moved into that in 92. So, uh, so I was doing something new that I hadn't done before. I mean, it was an interesting thing. Uh, I think one, you know, worried slightly about whether uh, Craig Venter would uh, be chosen by Burnaby. I think I knew, you know, there was just no future for me with Burnaby as the boss because we'd had a rather nasty argument when she was at the White House. She was for regulating plant biotechnology. And I was just totally opposed to any regulation. But I just saw her as a, a government wanting to regulate, even though she was you know, a Republican. And I more or less indicated, you don't know what you're doing. Probably a little so, more so, than more so or less, I, yeah. I didn't see her <laughs> with much respect. But, you know, I, I had gone through that period in the late 70s of recombinant DNA. And suddenly Bernadine was, you know, once you, uh, Monsanto was beginning to, you know, really uh, prosper, the plant part. So I did you ever have any thoughts that if, you, if you so, so stuck it out I for an extra six months, it would have been okay? I insulted her when she was in uh, the White House by himself. Okay. And then she's my boss. And, you know, so, but I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't neurotic about it. I didn't, you know, every day, when am I going to be fired? I, in fact, it was totally surprised. The one thing which was 
uh, a seedy character, and Bernadette really used it as a, a basis of our view was that there was an effort for poor inventor by a man named Frederick Burke, who had married a Ford and who wanted to hire John Solston away from England and set up a lab in mm -hmm. Seattle. And somehow someone arranged for Burke to come to the Banbury Center. And Burke and Norton Zinder and I were uh, sort of talking. And at the end, I, I just didn't like Burke at all. And uh, you know, more I said, again, you have no role in the Fujino project, because I saw him as killing. Uh, he had been supported by Lee Hood, who, who should get a copy of the letter from Lee to, to Bernadette, urging I be fired for not supporting industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so this Bernadette is going on at the same time as you are publicly also disagreeing about DNA patent policy. And the EST patents that yeah, NIH had filed. Yeah, but they wrote me it was about Burke. Uh, Burke, he, you know, ended up going to prison. Uh, Is that he, right? Yeah, he was convicted of some uh, financial shit. Yeah. And uh, he was a very smooth character. He was a smooth character, but uh, uh, I think I wanted to come to Banbury to see that I also have no rich people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're not, not impressed. Well, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, being in the library of the, uh, the uh, Robertson House when I worked there. And, uh, but, anyways, that letter from Lee, which I somehow saw, was used by Bernadine when she's, you know, uh, there was the patent thing. Right. And, and the allegations uh, are conflict of I interest. I was really, you know, all I didn't want is patents on nonsense DNA. You know, the CNA was, the ESTs, you know, I wasn't yeah. trying to break the patent system at that time. I, uh, you know, I wasn't. You know, there, was, there hadn't been myriad, or, you know, a, right. a case where I thought the public was losing. Yeah, it took 20 more years to break the patent system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so Jim, basically so, you've so done... I think Sorry. Uh, Bernadine probably, uh, the letter from Hood gave her the ammunition hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know who told me, all I know is uh, I met with the attorney and then uh, I had to hire an attorney. So you go from an office, a coordination office, to a national center for human genome research that is funding the beginnings of the Human Genome Project, starting to get maps, yeah. genetic linkage map, yeah. physical mapping effort is starting, technologies yeah. for doing sequencing but faster I, I and faster. I was trying to, to run the... Uh, You know, through advisory committees, because I remember meeting Venter and going to his lab and liking him and encouraging him to apply for money. He was then turned down by the committee, which I think was then the sequence committee, which was chaired by Joe Sandberg. And the money went instead to Lee Hood. And so Venture didn't get any money from us and was an incentive. But I would have given him the money. Was that when, when Craig was here in the intramural program? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. So he applied as an intramural scientist. So, yeah. So what happened is they did a study section. And it was a very odd arrangement, but they did the study section that in the morning reviewed a whole bunch of extramural grant applications. Mm -hmm. And in the afternoon, they did a review of the intramural proposal. Which was one proposal. Which was one proposal that involved Tom Kasky and Craig and um, hmm. Steve Warren and a bunch of other people. Hmm. Um, 
But Craig was the only one in the intramural program at that time. Right. But it, yeah. the money was going to be it. channeled it through. through. Yeah. Got it. And that didn't that review didn't go well. Actually, not, you see, to, to say the least, you could talk to Tom Caskey about that. Yeah, but he still know, remembers all, that review committee. All, all the sequencing, and then in Craig's lab was done by Dick Montgomery. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember. And uh, I remember well, who I hired afterwards. Right. At and uh, so Craig had good people working for me. Always mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. So, but that's what happened. And it, yeah. They, anyways, they didn't fund. Uh, you know, Gilbert. I wasn't. They funded. John and Bob to start on the nematode, and um, they funded Lee. They didn't fund Wally. Um, I can't remember all the results, and they did fund Fred Blattner to do E. coli, <laughs> which took a very sense. long time, as we all recall. So, so now we have a National Center for Human Genome Research. Jim has resigned. Um, we have an interregnum. Bernadine Healy is the director of NIH and is in charge of a very high pro profile search to find someone to take the reins of this National Center for Human Genome Research and enter Francis Collins. So tell us a little bit about yeah, the process. Yeah, sure. There was then a temporary head. Yeah. Yes, don't forget Michael Gottesman. Yes. Thank sure. you for Susan doing that. Susan Great, Crosby. so tell us about that. Well, Michael would say he got a call from Bernadine the same day uh, that Jim was being asked to leave and basically called in and said, you will do this. There was not a, are you interested? Are you willing? It was, you will do this. And Michael being a good scientist and somebody who I guess thought this was good for the country and good for science, uh, didn't object and took this on, hoping that he would have a short stay in that role. But he actually had about a year. Yeah. And his role up until that time at, was being an intramural scientist and at that status I mean, being a laboratory chief in the yeah, Cancer Institute. Exactly. So it's not that he had a right. major NIH-wide leadership role up until that point. But a thoughtful, dedicated, wonderful human being. So. Right. With fabulous political <laughs> skills exactly. and, a, yes. and a fantastic network yes. and highly respected by almost everybody, which Correct. was exactly what was needed. Yes. Right. So I had been a fan from the beginning of the importance of doing the genome project, but not did not in any way imagine being called upon uh, to take on this kind of role. Um, I was at that Reston meeting. I remember it well. I was at a meeting here at NIH where Ruth Kirstein uh, stood up and said that sh this should all be in GM, all the things we've just been talking about. I remember Jim standing up at that meeting and saying, everybody I've talked to at Cold Spring Harbor is opposed to the genome project, but I'm for it. <laughs> I remember that very clearly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually in this building on the top it floor. Was. Yeah, the sixth floor. floor. Right, conference room 10, probably. Uh, so, as the project began to have real opportunities uh, for getting going, yeah, Michigan was one of the first centers to apply and get supported. And ours was much more a medical genetics focus. Wasn't Tom Kasky the second? Tom was one of those first six as well. Washington yeah. University. Washu was one. Ah, boy, who were the other three? I couldn't at this point tell you. Stanford. Stanford. UCSF that then became Stanford, uh -huh. and then David Botstein had a center, right? Yeah, okay, okay. So this was exciting, trying to set this up. Um, and this was at a point where I was also the principal investigator on a gene therapy program project, so life was pretty busy, and I was a Hughes investigator and had a fair amount of clinical and teaching responsibilities. But I was having a great time. And I'm very much uh, amazed at Jim's leadership in recruiting talent into this area, because I mean, Jim will, hasn't really mentioned this, but the Genome Project never would have succeeded without his skill in convincing the best and brightest that this was a project they just didn't want to miss. They had to be part of this. And pulling people like Lander uh, into this who might have done something totally different uh, as well as many others. And that was fun to see the way in which that community began to develop. I was also a charter member of the advisory council to NHGRI, then called NCHGR. So I had the chance uh, during those so first couple of years. What was up. Yeah, I knew what was up and certainly participated in a lot of those discussions. Those were fascinating times. And by the way, there was already at that point, even before I got here, a discussion about, well, maybe there should be something intramural 
that had a focus on genomics because you could look at intramural and say, boy, they're good at a lot of stuff. But other than Venter and his sequencing effort, not much you'd call genomics uh, going on there, and that doesn't seem like a good thing. In the, well, the strength of NIH was never genetics. It was always biochemistry, and they exactly. were very good. They're very good at that, but they sort of weren't ready for this next uh, generation of ideas. But I thought, okay, this is the way it's going to be. I will hope that my genome center at Michigan can remain competitive, recognizing this is not going to be easy because Jim made it very clear. We're going to start funding, but we're not guaranteeing that you're going to stay in the mix uh, for 15 years. And then all of a sudden, there was this earthquake, and uh, phones rang, and people said, Watson has resigned. And uh, we were all in deep gloom about, my gosh, this is like a project that's still a baby in the crib. And suddenly, daddy has left, and who's going to take care of the baby? And a couple weeks later, it was Rick Klausner who called me. Because Bernadine, I didn't know Bernadine, and Bernadine didn't know me. And I guess she asked Rick to make the call, because Rick and I were scientific They got colleagues. along very well. They got well. along well. And Rick called and said, hey, Bernadine asked me to call you, and there's a search getting ready for this, and she wants you to apply. She thinks you would be appropriate for this. And I said, well, gosh, that's really flattering, but that's not my life plan. So <laughs> maybe you better let Bernadine know that I'm uh, probably not going to be a candidate. Now, and Rick called me another time or two and said, well, at least put your hat in, come down, do an interview, uh, at least find out what the job's about, let people talk to you. So I really went through the motions on that and showed up on a very hot day in August of uh, 1992 to be interviewed. And I think the search committee was chaired by Shirley Tillman. And I had not prepared anything. I just sort of walked in wearing cowboy boots and uh, carrying my guitar because uh, I had just been at a folk festival and I didn't want the guitar to sit in the car because it was too hot. So I'm sure I made a really good at impression. At least you were on your motorcycle <laughs> at that point. <laughs> Walking into building one like some country yokel. But it was an interesting conversation. And uh, it did intrigue me uh, that this was shaping up to be a pretty interesting opportunity. But it still didn't feel right for me I got shown around the lab space because I was you know, running a lab that was very productive. I didn't want to give up being an active scientist. They showed me Craig Venter's lab space because <laughs> he by then had just space. left. Yeah. Brand new lab space. Yeah. Uh, but it just didn't feel right at all. A government employee, really? I don't think so. So I actually did have some discussions about, is it possible to do this and keep my lab and myself in Ann Arbor? Do what Jim did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> try to stay at a distance, and they would have none of that. Yeah. Uh, that, that model and, was no and longer accepted. Of that, no, they would probably, work. Yeah, they were right. Um, so ultimately, I did get offered the job in uh, probably September, October, and I said no. Uh, it was not sort of fitting with what I thought I really could do. Did you? Uh, did your salary go up or down? You know, I don't remember. <laughs> I've maybe not even been smart enough to ask the question. I, I think it was fairly sort of neutral in that regard, yeah. as opposed to later on when it became very negative. <laughs> and Washington <laughs> then wasn't hopelessly expensive. Uh, not hopelessly, but... It was expensive. Compared to Ann Arbor, it certainly was. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually, speaking of personal issues, uh, in the midst of going through divorce, and uh, my kids had just reached the point of being just about launched. Uh, my youngest daughter was a senior in high school. So maybe it was sort of a moment of thinking about being more geographically portable. But again, scientifically, I just couldn't see walking away from what I had been doing. And we were in the throes of trying to actually find the Huntington's gene, which we found a couple months after that, and trying to find the breast cancer gene, which Mark Skolnick beat Mary Claire and me to. Uh, a few months after that. So I was intensely involved in other things. And I said no. And the search got started again. And there was a uh, effort to identify other candidates. Frank Ruddle emerged as a possible choice. Mary Claire emerged as a possible choice. Mm -hmm. And I came back, I think it was for a study section, and Bernadine asked to see me. And I thought, oh boy, here comes the hard sell. And this must have been like late, maybe November of 92. And yeah, she brought me in, and she had Lance Leota in the office, Lance, who was the director of intramural. 
who was making all sorts of inappropriate comments about how great it would be uh, to be at NIH, which I had no real interest. I was there to say no again. But Bernadine kind of took over the conversation, and she got me right in this vulnerable place. And she said, I can tell I'm not getting through to you, she said. And she was right. She said, I have this vision, Francis, that we're both somewhere in an old age home, and you're walking down the hall with your walker, and I'm walking down the hall towards you with my walker, and we come up next to each other, and you turn to me and you say, damn it, Bernie, I should have taken that job. Which was the dumbest thing anybody ever said to me in a serious job interview, but it totally nailed what was bugging me, that I was about to walk away from maybe the most significant scientific opportunity anybody of this era could dream of, because it didn't happen to suit my timing. And it really shook me up. I mean, isn't that stupid? That, that's what it took. <laughs> so I went away and thought about it, and two days later I called her and said, okay, I'll do it. So she did have some of Lyndon Johnson's political skills. Ah, uh, something. I don't know. Or maybe I was ready to give in and I just hadn't admitted it. No, she could be charming. She could be. She could also she be She was really, really charming. She was difficult. Brilliant. No, but brilliant she didn't charm the people at Johns Hopkins. They couldn't stand her. Oh, and she terrified her own staff. I mean, boy, once I got here and began to see what happens when there's a meeting in Building 1, everybody comes out <laughs> looking devastated, <laughs> white, <laughs> tearing their hair about what they've been asked to do. Uh, so, so there so it was. Francis, what was your... How important was constructing the intramural research program? How was that involved in these negotiations over becoming director of this still center of human genome research? Yeah, again, the council had already sort of made a conclusion that there ought to be something going on intramurally. And I felt like, okay, that's something I could help with because it was clearly gonna have to be built by recruitment. There was virtually nobody on the campus other than a couple of very junior people like Dave Bodine uh, that could be recruited into this. Otherwise, I'm going to have to convince other really good scientists not to come and work in this environment, which many people were skeptical about. But I thought I could do that, and I thought in the longer term that's a contribution I could make. But I never had any misgivings about whether that was the main job. The main job was to get the Genome Project to succeed in, in that rather arbitrary 15-year timetable that Jim made up at some point along the way because it sounded like something you could sell to the Congress, right? I mean, where did 15 years come from anyway? Generally, you, you don't propose anything more than 10 years. But I knew <laughs> 20 would mean the project would be finished by people who didn't start it. And uh, it would be, uh, but I just didn't see it being done in 10 years. That was good. And, uh, but I didn't <laughs> see the machines taking over. Mm -hmm. So it was the machines made 10 years possible. Well, and I but think there was, was another element to that, and that was when the NRC oh. committee was meeting, and David Botstein was in charge of the subcommittee that was supposed to come up with budget numbers, where they did the famous go around the table and vote. And they'd gone around the table once, and they had ranges from 50 million, 100 million, and 200 million. Jim intervenes and says, no, I want to propose 500 million a year. Because if, I, if 200 is the high one, everybody's going to go for the middle. That's a very important right? principle. So the budget had come out at 200 million a year, and everybody had agreed to that. Well, how do you get to 3 billion from 200 million a year? Do the math. 15 years. <laughs> so that's, like part that. of, that's part of the origin like of that. 15 years also. It was... Yeah. But th there wasn't much disagreement. I think it, it didn't put much pressure on us to start from, you know, we got 15 years. Yeah. And uh, just thank God for those machines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that just the time came along. <laughs> so, yeah. so you step in, and what are the problems that are facing you as you're taking the reins of this National Center for Human Genome Research? Uh, well, there were lots of them. Uh, it still seemed like this project was barely sort of beginning to get itself organized. And I mean, it's only three years into a 15-year effort, and frankly, most of the centers hadn't really gotten started for that first year and a half. And it was clear that there were some that were starting to catch some real momentum, and it was already clear there were some that were going to be struggling. And so part of what I would have to do is not only give money to people, but take it away, which was not going to be that much fun. Fortunately, um, at that point, 
A new NIH director arrived on the scene. Uh, just six months after I arrived, Harold Barmas arrived. Uh, Harold and I, for the first six months, uh, lived in apartments in the old nurses' dorm uh, right here on campus, and a cockroach-infested facility. But it was great because we had many evenings after struggling with how to make things work in the government, which was foreign to both of us, and neither of us had ever really run anything very big. Uh, and we would meet in Harold's apartment at 10 o'clock over a glass of wine and try to figure out what the hell we were doing and how to make the whole thing succeed. And that was really helpful. And he was enormously supportive. Uh, so this was things. a Clinton presidency. By this time, uh, Clinton had been elected. And Donna Shalala uh, was the secretary, who was enormously encouraging to both me and to Harold. So yeah, the environment for support of science was very, very good. And that, that helped a lot. And I did have good fortune by recruiting not just one at a time, but sort of a whole cohort of really excellent extramural scientists to come and start this intramural program. People like Bob Nussbaum, Eric Green, uh, David Ledbetter, uh, people that I always thought, boy, it'd be great to work with them. And they all sort of made the same conclusion. What happened to Klausner? Ah, that's a long story. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get into that. No, I yeah, know yeah, yeah, we'll take that a, offline afterwards. Uh, he went National to the Harvard. Cancer Institute, uh, then he went to the Gates Foundation. Uh, he well, is Case now, Foundation and then Gates. And then Gates, right. I forgot about Steve Case was in there. Then Gates. Uh, he is now the chief medical officer for Illumina. He's out there pushing DNA sequencing. Oh, boy. So he's <laughs> on top. <laughs> he's doing well. <laughs> he's doing just fine. So Francis, you've, you've been involved at this point in very high profile gene hunts. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions for you. One is, what's the first time you ever testified in Congress? Ha. So it was in front of Al Gore uh, in a Senate panel about the Genome Project. Uh, other witnesses being Jim, um, Nancy Wexler. This was the ethics thing. This was the ethics thing. And uh, the poor guy from DOE, Benjamin Barnhart, who was uh, basically saying DOE didn't have a plan, and that didn't turn out so well. You remember that? Yeah, and Gore was very well primed because I think somebody had uh, uh, helped him think about these issues, <laughs> and yeah. that that was my first uh, appearance. But the DOE decided to do education, yes. whereas we were going to do ethics. Yes, and uh, I went into the when I was appointed into that press conference. knowing I should say something about ethics because I was afraid of being attacked this way. So the first thing I said is we're going to have an ethics panel and we're going to spend 3% of the money because 1% sounded like a token. <laughs> and, and then Gore said you're going to spend 5%. I remember sitting next to Nancy when he said it. <laughs> yeah, that was a moment. <laughs> and. Uh, but uh, So Jim, just to put that in context, so you're talking about the press conference when you were announced as the head of the Office for Human Genome Research in September of 88. Is that, that's what you're referring to there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that was the... So that's, in many ways, that's the origin of what became known as the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Elsie. Research Program. That was Elsie's start right and there. And I think if we... It made the same, but you know, it was basically premature until you had the genome. There weren't that many ethical issues. So I'm conflicted on this issue, but what do you guys have to say? <laughs> yeah, I bet you are too. <laughs> no, because, uh, uh, and now we have real ethical issues, but we don't, we can't solve them. You know, beginning of life and end of life issues. Should you uh, encourage life of someone who will have no future? And then how do you define, uh, how do you know someone will have no future? And these sort of things. But uh, I think uh, there's no point in discussing them because it will get nowhere. But, uh, but back to the sense of having a program in this area, it's a truly distinctive feature of it's been in so-called kind of in the DNA of this institute from what became so. an institute from the very beginning, from 
the press conference yeah, where it no, was announced. No, uh, the ethical things were largely taken over by mediocre people. I have a slightly more positive view, although I do yeah. think there were some of the LC activities that had very little long-term impact on anything. Yeah. Uh, certainly the more specific policy-focused efforts, like how do we begin to think about uh, what is appropriate to be publicly disclosed and what's not, something we're still arguing about, of course. Uh, things about, you know, if you're going to sequence the human genome, whose DNA should it be? And is that somebody whose identity should be known, uh, who's going to be the reference standard? Uh, issues such as genetic discrimination, which became a personal passion of mine because I was really quite worried if we didn't deal with that, that the public would stay away from, from involvement and utilization of all of this science. And we had to have some pretty good, serious legal sort of deliberations about how do you solve that? Uh, which ultimately, after 12 years <laughs> of struggling with the Congress, resulted in GINA uh, being passed. And I think while the ELSI program was not the only reason that succeeded, it provided a, a useful scholarly foundation upon which you could build a case. So Eric, how do you think of having an ELSI program being integrated into your institute? I think it's valuable. I, one of the things I would immediately say is you go talk to members of the general public, you go talk to a high school class, you go talk to a, a PTA or any of these public outreach efforts and you explain genomics, their questions inevitably are heavily enriched to ones related to ethical and societal issues. And so I think it's irresponsible not to then immediately say it's very important that we study these things because these are clearly concerns people have. Um, one of the surprises I would certainly say I had when I became director was when somebody came and told me that our LC research program is the largest program in bioethics in the world. In the in history of, of the world. History of the world. Yeah. That's a block of funding, which I admit I hadn't realized. I mean, I knew it was distinct. I knew, I knew, the, knew there weren't very many of them. I just didn't know it was the largest because I feel like everything we do as an institute is relatively small because the size of our institute is only 5%. Uh, and so that with that comes uh, sort of a lot of responsibility in terms of trying to prioritize. I, in the time since I've been director, I've tried to broaden the discussion around so sort of the broader societal issues, not exclusively focused on ethical, legal, and social. I also think the LC brand has sort of accumulated some baggage. You can hear some of Jim's comments, the kind of baggage it's accumulated. So part of the reason I even wanted to sort of change the focus to a broader uh, um, label was also to sort of give us more flexibility to think about what are the societal issues we should be studying in thinking about genomic advances. I think uh, now I'm much more libertarian than I was when I started the LC program. <laughs> and just find it so arbitrary as to what answer you come to that I'd prefer no regulations and no one telling you what to do or not do would be healthier than our current one, which I, I saw the ethicists as people who fundamentally hated genetics. And so they were really trying to block us. And that's what I, but I saw no alternative, but at least when I started to have them, but then it was that we're dealing with problems which don't have obvious answers. or uh, And well, so just to, we were giving money so we could have discussions, but it wasn't going to change how humans behaved. Well, just one very practical thing. You alluded to it in passing, Francis. You might dilate on it a little bit, is if the sequencing effort had built on the resources that were available from the one individual from chromosome 19 studies that had been selected, um, the world would have been a rather different place because our reference sequence would have been to a person who could have been identified. And as I understand it, the reset button was pushed at one point precisely because somebody thought, ooh, maybe it's not such a good idea. I don't know if that somebody was you or yeah. a group. I was part but, of that. But I think. Uh, yeah, so that seems cool. like it's a very practical thing that changes because you're thinking about these issues. It may not be the research program per se. And it's not really regulation. It's a fateful choice that you make in light of having thought about something you might not have otherwise well, thought of. Stimulating the dialogue. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, 
You know, we don't spend lots of money talking what to do about medical records and how are they secure. And we were sort of saying genetic are more important. I don't think they are in a practical way. It's the affecting whether you should have a job or something like this. And I don't know so far of anyone who's yet been damaged by release of genetic knowledge. I mean, you can, but it seemed to be just minor problems compared to the very major problems of genetic Healthcare, disease. Right. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. That I think I wouldn't recommend you guys get rid of Elsie, you would just get into trouble. But I give I would give the program about half percent. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know, because I'd have to compare the alternatives of which ways you would use the money. Right. Jim's very interesting because right now, as we're starting the Brain Initiative, this very ambitious effort, which many people are comparing to the Genome Project because it's a 12 year program to try to under how, understand how the circuits in the brain work. Very challenging imagining. And we're getting a lot of pressure. Well, you need to have an ethics program because this is going to result in the opportunity to manipulate. I uh, think human the brain. chance of the, the ethics program, <laughs> you know, we're not going to understand the brain as well. Well, understand. We have to decide what we mean by understand. I think we understand it better than we do now. That's safe. But, but <laughs> we better. But right now, we have not solved any big problem. And we need to do that. That's all. So, Francis, back to and you. And it's very hard. You walk and in the door, and you're trying to put the reins in. Maybe just walk us through what's going on with the genetic linkage map, what's going on with the physical map, where are you in sequencing? Give us a segue into this this move from laying the foundations for the ultimate goal, the reference sequence. This is happening on your watch. And also, you go from a center to an institute. So tell us a little bit about what's going on on your watch or the structural features of your institute. So it's fascinating. It's a bit chaotic. It's up and down. Uh, the interactions between the centers are not always as smooth as you would like. <laughs> Uh, the genetic linkage map is coming along using microsatellite maps, uh, which is finally sort of really beginning to produce uh, reasonable quantities of such markers so that people can start to do linkage much more efficiently. The physical maps uh, are starting to take shape as well. Backs and yaks are making it possible to do things across long distances. Sequencing is pretty much devoted to model organisms, the E. coli effort taking forever, uh, yeast coming along, uh, but C. elegans uh, really becoming the place where you could see this is how to organize an effective program between Solston and Waterston. This becomes our model of what we hope ultimately could be scaled up, but not without a lot of very hard work and something that in many ways doesn't look like it will be very scalable to a genome the size of the human. So I have many anxious moments uh, in that first five years uh, trying to figure out how am I going to give the speech when we basically miss our deadline and we don't have the human genome sequence at the deadline that Jim had promised. Uh, fortunately, I never had to give that speech. Uh, fortunately, uh, things really began to connect. But I depended a lot on these various, some small, some large gatherings of advisors. And we, the fact that we did this, what sounded rather Maoist, a series of five-year plans was very valuable for this program. And of course, there was one in 1990, and then there was another one in 1993, shortly after I got there, and then there was another in 1998. So we kept refreshing, and those plans incorporated uh, the best ideas of two or 300 people in various ways in order to be sure we were on track. You know, it's interesting. You talked about this was a top-down project, and of course, it did have to be in a certain way, but it was also bottom-up. I mean, we basically set, here are the big goals, but then we didn't tell Bob Waterston, what particular uh, strategy he should use no. uh, to achieve those goals. And ultimately, when we got to the point of being ready to really scale up human sequencing, it was those five centers that we referred to affectionately as the G5, uh, starting in 1998. Every Friday morning, 11 o'clock, I still, Fridays at 11 o'clock, I have this anxious moment about, oh my God, am I ready for the G5 call? Because had to set the agenda, and you never quite knew. And some of those were pretty prickly at the beginning <laughs> before we finally really all gelled the whole thing as a team. When but did, those five were very much bottom up, making this happen. When did Venter 
Imperial Gold Spring Harbor. May of 1998. 98. Yes. And that was a, a month before I got married. <laughs> yeah, and that was quite the experience because <clears throat> he was going to appear at Cold Spring Harbor the next week and he already had talked to Nick Wade and Nick Wade already had his story ready for the Sunday New York Times. And I was on my way to California uh, to talk at some meeting and I was asked to meet Venter and some surprise person in the red carpet lounge at Dulles Airport. And I walk in and there's Venter and there's Hunkapiller. Oh. And then I know what's going on. And so they sort of Did you drop. gotten wind of what well, became Solera uh, by then at all? We knew something was up because Venter's uh, Tiger uh, Genome Center, which was doing chromosome 16, had suddenly, well, not suddenly, over the previous year, sort of seemed to have slipped into the doldrums, whereas usually he was so aggressive and driving and it just like it was coasting and you had to think, Something's going on here. Craig's got another plan, but we're not. When being was told. Tiger founded? Oh gosh, 94, 95, somewhere. I don't there. remember. No, it may be in 93. It was when Craig left. It was NIH. when he left the intramural program. And when was human genome science? Yeah. Same, same time. Same time. Yeah. It so was, uh, basically, so, so Tiger human genome formed science genome funded science Tiger. Is the exactly. Tiger was their sort of action. And plan. that's where, through. So at the right time, Bill Hazeltine became rich. He did. <laughs> he did quite well for himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so Craig was hired to do Tiger, and then Bill Hazeltine was hired to direct to human, human genome, genome science. Sciences. Right. And right. human genome science, they finally did produce some drug, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, a drug, Benlista, uh, for lupus, which is been moderately successful. I don't think anybody would say it's turned into a blockbuster home run, but it's yeah. been a drug. But Bill certainly left the uh, human genome science under a cloud, personally. Uh, I think people felt, yeah, he was because, uh, uh, ready to move. His daughter had built a, uh, a really very nice sculpture on protein synthesis, uh, which was at human genome sciences. Oh. And suddenly we were offered it at Cold Spring Harbor. And that's the one that's up there yes. on top of the hill? Yes. Know. That was made by Hazeltine's daughter. Yes, I did not it's very know. good. It is very good. <laughs> yeah, I look at very, it every time I didn't I'm know there. that story. Of but. course, his brother is like a big fixture at, at Disney. Did I ever tell you the story about calling his brother? This is a good story. Go for it. When we were getting ready, this is after the genome of a human is done, and it's time to sort of try to finish off the mouse, because yeah. everybody's clamoring, can we get the mouse, can we get the mouse? And we didn't have enough money, uh, and I was tin cupping all the institutes, asking them to donate, and they were giving me little bits and pieces, and I got some money out of Perligen, because they were feeling like they needed this too, but it still wasn't enough. So I had this great idea. Okay, what's the most famous mouse in the world? Well, it's Mickey Mouse, of course. So maybe Disney would like to contribute. Yeah. So we could hurry up and sequence the genome of Mickey Mouse. So I called Eric Hazeltine, who yeah. is uh, Bill's brother, and made the pitch. Oh. And he said, well, I have to think about that and talk about it to the board. And he calls me back the next day and he said, well, I've discussed it, but I'm sorry to say we're not gonna support this. Mickey Mouse is magic, he doesn't have a genome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a good story. <laughs> they thought it was going to ruin their brand, you know? <laughs> Mickey with DNA? Nah, I can't do that. <laughs> that is a good story. So back to, you're trying to construct this. Tell us a little bit about the shift to sequencing, the Bermuda principles, yeah. the <clears throat> consolidation around the model of C. elegans as the way to do science, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your role as the NHGRI director. Weren't there two Bermuda meetings? Oh, oh there one. were three. three. Three, at least three. three. Yeah, three. Oh. But 1996, sort of the signal moment uh, of gathering together the sequencing centers um, to see where are we and what path are we on. And I still have my notes from that meeting. Uh, which and you it, kindly shared with us. That's right. You have, the archives. you have seen those. That's the one where we said they did ask to place in front of the public. Isn't exactly. It? And so there was a session. In fact, it was sort of came up twice. There was an initial session that John and Bob yeah. uh, kind of led. And there was a general sort of sense of this is probably the right thing to do, but we hadn't actually reached a conclusion. And then uh, we came back to it. At that point, by the way, Venter had left. 
because he was clearly one of those who was not particularly positive about this Bermuda Rules uh, proposal. But he left early. We came back to it at the end, and everybody agreed. Although most of the people in the room had no authority to agree to this, representing countries uh, whose intellectual property they had just given away. <laughs> but oh well. <laughs> but it had a great effect. It had, it had exactly the right effect. And you know, when everybody talks about the race for the human genome between Solera and the public project, it wasn't about the technology. It wasn't about you know who had which machines or which software as much as people try to make it that. It was about what is the model? Is this a public domain deposition of our shared inheritance or is this a commodity? I wish they had gotten that message a little more clearly as people began to argue about which model was right, because so much of the focus missed I mean, the point. Was, it was really there when Wally was going to form his company and own the genome. Yeah. And it was certainly there when Burke was going to form it his was, company and, and own the genome. It was, and then it was there again uh, when Solera was going to do the same thing, although I think they tried to mask uh, the intentions in a fairly clever way so that if you weren't paying attention, you might thought, oh, they are going to give it away. No. <laughs> We all knew that, didn't we? They're not going to give away their founder's sequence. Mm. <laughs> Meanwhile, in, in that mix, of course, we had that very awkward moment when DOE uh, pretty much came that close to signing a, a memorandum of understanding with Solera on their chromosomes, you know, that they were going to make a partnership because they felt under pressure to work with the private sector. And I think quite naively uh, thought that this memorandum of understanding mm -hmm had no consequences for Bermuda rules, and it clearly did. And only at the very last minute did this get realized, and I and Waterston and Lander uh, and uh, Michael Morgan basically said, you can't do this. And that was a very bad, awkward moment uh, for Ari, for everybody else involved at DOE, who thought that they were kind of trying to do something to make peace and realized that the terms of the peace agreement were not what anybody really would have wanted to live with. So this is going on at more or less the same time as you're just now an institute. So talk a little bit about <laughs> the, the process of going from center to institute. What does this mean? What does it matter? <laughs> well, it, frankly, the difference in terms of the mechanisms that an institute can use compared to a center there are pretty small differences there. Uh, so while I made the case that we needed to be a full-fledged institute in order to have the same capabilities as all the others, uh, it was really, I think, more about recognition that this is here to stay, uh, that this is not something that's maybe going to just be absorbed uh, in some other way, that this is really serious, that NIH is making a long-term commitment. And so I pushed, I, you know, when I first agreed to take the job back in 1993, I wanted any NCHGR to become an institute then. And Bernadine said she would support that, but it didn't, it didn't fly. It was late in the process of NIH's reauthorization, which happened in 1993, and it was already pretty much a done deal, and nobody wanted to open it up again and do something that might be controversial. And frankly, the human genetics community was not supportive of that at that point. You said the human geneticists always supported the Genome Project. Not all of them did. Some of them were threatened, <coughs> thought it was going to take money away from their R1s. But every year that this would come up again, I would make the case. And it was Donna Shalala who really got that, supported that, saw that this was something she wanted to take a role. And she had the authority. It did not right. require an act of Congress right. uh, to elevate us to an institute. The secretary could do it. And so she, who did she, figure out that you had to change the acronym order? <laughs> that was not hard. <laughs> uh, substitute I instead of C and then try to pronounce that. You don't want to go there. Right. So we had many other but somebody's awake, you know? That's good. <laughs> many other arguments about what the alternative should be. And and it's not unprecedented. I mean N H L B I, N E I, there's lots N C I, lots of institutes where I is the last letter. So right. why not N H G R I? It took us a while to say those letters without tangling Stumbling. our tongues right. up. But we got How did Santa Cruz get started? Oh, that's a good story. Um, Lander. Lander, uh, recognizing that while we were winning the battle in terms of data production, uh, we were not getting anywhere as far as data assembly, yeah. and that the gurus that were supposed to be helping us, many of whom were at NCBI, uh, were working hard, but they were not 
really creative about solving the problem of this large scale assembly. So this was uh, an opportunity uh, that UC Santa Cruz was just emerging with David Hausler, who clearly had both the smarts and the drive uh, yeah. to make that happen. And with Jim Kent, uh, his uh, remember Jim, who's this guy with hair out to here and oh, who had sure. basically been a video game programmer uh, in his garage, uh, kind of put together the algorithms uh, that started to make the assembly work. And now look at UC Santa Cruz. I mean, they are the powerhouse of large scale representations I mean, of uh, genomes. How much money did you give to Santa Cruz? <laughs> oh, um, a lot. I don't know the exact figure. I mean, is but, it, yeah. you know, more than one million, yes. but say up to 10? Yeah, probably in that range. Yeah, okay. But Lander personally got Hausler engaged, correct? And I it was at Cold Spring Harbor, Jim. Yeah. It was must have been 1999 Cold Spring Harbor meeting in May, uh, where Hausler came. He had not been known uh, by most people. Yeah. And uh, Eric had brought him there, and we had this long conversation out on the lawn about what needed to be done. You were around for that, too. Yeah, it was. And uh, it was pretty compelling that this was a solution to a problem that we had only fairly recently begun to appreciate could have ruined the entire promise. Of the I enterprise. assumed that Lander would do it, but he couldn't. <laughs> couldn't do it himself. Didn't have No, it. no. No. And then he didn't have anyone else there who could do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one other thing that you haven't touched on quite yet, um, Francis, is this change of politics with the emergence of Solera. We've mentioned that Solera comes on the scene in May of 1998. Okay. But that kind of changes the politics of how you're going to go about your job in two respects. One is you have to defend your project suddenly in Congress that July. And also, you now have a common enemy that unifies your troops. Can you do, I don't want to do too much counterfactual, what would have happened but for if there'd never been a Solera, but how do you balance thinking about the presence of a private sector, basically a private sector competitor that enters your space. Uh, that was tumultuous, to be sure. And uh, of course, Venter, not lacking in confidence, uh, was certainly making it quite clear uh, that from perspective of anybody willing to listen to him, the public project should probably just step back. And as he said, you can do mouse. Uh, yeah. We'll take care of the human. Yeah, um, that was a very stupid statement. <laughs> it really mobilized me. <laughs> well, right. So this was the famous meeting at Cold Spring Harbor shortly after that, where I remember uh, Jim coming up to me in the cafeteria and saying, so are you going to be Neville Chamberlain or Winston Churchill? <laughs> no, it's pretty thought... clear what you meant. <laughs> yes, that, that we had to, uh, we, we couldn't lose. Uh, we yeah. could not lose, yeah, yes. So we could not lose. <laughs> so yeah. there was a lot of tumult in terms of, okay, uh, should we stay the exact course that we are on, which was finish as you go, build the physical maps, then sequence uh, those backs as you are sure that you have them in the right order, and then you've got the assembled sequence, and you don't have to go back and fill in many gaps later because you've already done that part. Or is it time to say our sequencing capacity has now started to really increase? Machines are coming on board that have high throughput. We're having trouble keeping up uh, with the machine capacity with the backs that have been mapped. Uh, should we go into a different mode? And that's the big debate that then raged in the course of the summer and the fall of 98, at one point resulting in a very angry email from John Sulston, uh, the subject line of which was friendly fire. Uh, where he was very upset uh, that the U.S. seemed to be deviating uh, from this. Uh, you mean to go to the whole genome shotgun? Yeah, yeah. instead of starting with a random back strategy, which yeah. would keep the machines uh, busy, but sort of abandoned the, the process sure. that particularly Sanger had been very much devoted to and were very well prepared to do. That was a bad moment, that sort of uh, big uh, uncertainty. We fixed it pretty quickly. I think, Jim, you got involved in helping a little bit, sort of calm down uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Sosin, British uh, emotions. Sosin has, it's like a preacher. I mean, he's really uh, <laughs> he got very righteous. A, you know, he may have come out of a Methodist background, but you know, there was a certain. Uh, he's a Baptist at heart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know what it was, but he was so clearly wrong. 
Yeah, he was in that situation. But boy, but he, was see, he was powerfully not, excited. He was not a mathematician. He didn't understand it. Yeah. And so he wanted to say with something that he could control. And he felt he'd put a lot. And frankly, there was a little bit of, hey, we did this part already, guys. You over there in the US, you didn't build your maps this nicely. Don't look to us now to say you have to change strategy because you're behind no. your schedule. But he was wrong. He was so wrong. what's it feel like to manage this kind of uh, army in rebellion against a uh, well-greased, well-oiled, well-funded machine? It was, it was a wild ride, so uh, but the, it was good uh, fun. The, the White House appearance was in the last year of Clinton's term. So yep. it would be in 2000. 2000, June 26. And we all went to the White House. We all did. You know, I remember a particular meeting in Houston, sort of uh, February 1999. We had had this discussion about, are we going to shift more into random back strategy? And I, on the way out there, I'd been looking at all the throughput numbers from what the centers could do. And at that point, we were still saying, we're going to finish the genome in 2003. And looking at the way in which the machine outputs had been going up like this, and what you could do if you decided to really pull out all the stops, it looked to me like we could get done in the spring of 2000. <clears throat> and I hadn't talked to Elka, and I hadn't talked to Mark. I just decided, OK, let's lay it out there. And so at the beginning of that meeting of the PIs, I basically laid it out. I still have the overhead, because of course, we used overheads in those days. <laughs> that went through the tabulation of how that could be possible. And there was a furious discussion at that point because the Genome Center directors were really tired of having the plan changed <clears throat> almost every couple of months, just when they thought they had their teams organized, we're going to do this, and now all of a sudden, Collins is saying, no, we're going to do that. But ultimately, by the end of that two-day meeting, people said, OK, let's, let's pull out all the stops. Let's go. And it didn't hurt that Solera was you know, breathing down our necks. This was by now February 99. Craig was making all sorts of noises about how much he has done. And of course, nobody could tell, because none of the data was public, but made you nervous. So February 99, it was just then 16 months later, the draft was announced as being done. So most of the genome got sequenced in that last sort of 16 months. Yeah, we were sure. only 10% done in February of 99. Then we had our billion base pair bash. Yeah. No, November. it was, you know, the, the only thing that mattered were the machine progress then. That's what made it possible. We had to do 1,000 base pairs a second, seven days a week, 24 hours a day to get this done. Yeah. 1,000 base pairs a second was so far out of range of the previous version of the machine. Yeah, sure. But this made it all possible. So Francis, to your knowledge, has a, an NIH Institute director ever stood beside the President of the United States with a, hmm. a press conference that's going on in Downing Street and <laughs> at the US uh, White House simultaneously? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that moment, what that feels like. Well, it was, it was a little odd. Well, I mean, of course, only a month before that uh, was there an agreement about how to do this sort of announcement so that there wasn't going to be <clears throat> sort of competing claims uh, from the public project and Solera about who had done it. I mean, it was pretty clear that they were moving along. Of course, they were using all of our data, <laughs> plus adding their own data to it. So if we had A and they had generated B, they really had A plus B. So how could they be behind, right? <laughs> And it was pretty clear by about that time, we would all be able to say, we have 90% of the information, so let's call that a draft. Uh, but it was getting really nasty. There was all kinds of claims and counterclaims. And I will say, after one of those really difficult times, I went to Ruth Kirstein, who at that point uh, was, because uh, Harold had stepped down and said, you know, Ruth, I think I want to try to broker a piece, but I can't do it myself. I just want you to know I'm going to ask Ari to help with this. Because Ari had said all along, hey, if you need a peacemaker, maybe I can be it. You mean and that led to the White House speech? That did. So Ari convened Craig and me in his basement over pizza and beer. And I felt very awkward about that because nobody knew that was happening, including my British colleagues. And I sort of felt like I'm negotiating for people without their knowledge. Yeah. But it just seemed like we had to come up with something that got away from all the tawdry accusations yeah. about who was telling the truth. Did institute and staff know at the time? Your senior institute staff? No. Or just you alone? The first meeting. I told them, yeah. and then we met again the second time. 
And basically, uh, and it, to Craig's credit, uh, he agreed that this was the best outcome as well. And I'm sure he didn't mind the idea of standing next to the president either. And so yeah. then there was this furious arrangement about the timing and when was the president going to be in town? And then ultimately there on June 26th, uh, we all arrived. And so we all arrived in the blue room and uh, stood around waiting. And the president shows up with his Diet Coke. And uh, we've all gotten our instructions about who's supposed to stand where and how you're supposed to walk down the carpet to the East Room. And I did have a embarrassing moment there, one of many in my uh, career, where the guy who was doing the stage managing said, now you're going to walk on the left hand of the president and Venter's going to walk on the right hand. And we're in the blue room, so we have to walk out into the hallway. And I'm thinking, well, if I'm on the left, that means I need to be here and the president will be next to me, so I better kind of go out there first. And they start playing Hail to the Chief. So I head out onto the red carpet and Bill Clinton's arm is on my shoulder and he's saying, no, no, I go first. <laughs> Oops. He had a point. <laughs> I'm just trying to follow the direction. Uh, so, you know, as Sulston said in his book, we were all phonies that day because uh, we didn't have a publication. We didn't have the usual scientific standard for having something that you could really uh, look at and say, wow, look at this. That came, of course, in February of the next year. But it was the right thing to do uh, to get the word out there. And my gosh, the way in which that electrified uh, public imagination <clears throat> was far beyond anything I would have guessed. It also so, changed the topic. Changed the topic. We're not doing a race right. anymore. Right. Now we're going to figure out, what do we do with this information? We've crossed a threshold into a really exciting place. So Francis, uh, one of the other things, so you're finished, in a way, you're not really finished, but you are have a lot of momentum to finish in 2000, two years later. Um, and you celebrated that moment on April 14th of 2003. It happened um, to be my birthday, yeah. Um, <laughs> but that was a pure coincidence. And of course, the other wonderful thing about April 2003 was this 50th anniversary of the double helix. I mean, talk about having something in perfect poetic alignment to have those things spanning by exactly 50 years to the month just seemed No, that was, uh, ideal. Yeah, that was nice. That was really nice. So Bob, your question about sort of what's next. I think Francis mentioned two critical things that happened in April 2003, completion of the Human Genome Project, celebration of the 50th anniversary discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. But there was a third thing that happened on that day for the Institute, and that was publication of a new strategic plan, which followed in the footsteps of what Francis talked about earlier, this culture of always renewing your vision. Yeah. So I think Francis should say some things about what led up to the end of the Genome Project. It wasn't as if we weren't thinking about what's next, because he had put in place a planning process that led to that 2003 strategic plan. And that was a vigorous process, to be sure, extending over about 18 months. I think we had two major meetings, nine topic-specific workshops, uh, input from all kinds of people with bright ideas, and ultimately resulting in this piece uh, in Nature that laid out what we hoped we could do in the next five years, pretty much all of which we did. And of course, a lot of that was, OK, uh, let's learn about variation. So HapMap, uh, which I think became a very important next step contribution, which has opened up all kinds of windows into understanding genetics of common disease. Uh, projects like ENCODE. They gave us GWAS. Gave us GWAS, which has been, <laughs> I think, actually <laughs> undervalued for what it has told us about mechanism, but overvalued in terms of what it's told us about predictions, because the things we have found have relatively weak contributions as far as risks. Uh, things like ENCODE, really a, an organized effort to bring together dozens of laboratories to understand what are, the, you know, what's the parts list of the genome and what do those parts do? How and, does the function work? And technology investment. And technology investment in a big way. And lots of other things. The Knockout Mouse Project uh, to try to can, systematically. Can you really compete with private investors? In technology development? Yeah. You know, not at the sort of end point yes. of getting something hardened and uh, out there, but boy, at the front end of coming up with a new idea. I mean, if you look at sequencing technology, the stuff that Jeff Schloss has made possible is one of the reasons why we have almost a thousand dollar genome because of all those academics and small companies uh, that were boosted uh, by NHGRI support uh, okay. to take a risk. Sure. They would otherwise not well, have taken so it's just to I think yeah, that's worthwhile. I think it is. Recording is a serious 
It is very. Doc Cuban. There, was a, there was a nice nature. Beautiful article on nature this year that had a wonderful shout out about the Institute saying that a major part of the credit for the rapid decline in DNA sequencing costs go to the grants program out of NHGRI. Yeah, and documenting the reasons why they said that. Right. Yeah. yeah, so. You mean it's been done already? It, well, it's been done in a sort of a news article. Uh, we're yeah, in the yeah, process. That's not with, sufficient. No, within, the, within the institute, there's an effort to document exactly how it is that our grants program has no, led. No, 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 pH sequencing or nanopore sequencing would have happened, but for having an NHGRI program? Maybe eventually, but not at this pace. Uh, we would have lost many years if it weren't for that source of support to have people pursue those ideas on a shoestring uh, when they weren't at all sure they were going to work, and they would have had a hard time getting funds. Where did the Illumina's ideas come from? Ha. Uh -huh. They were Selexa. The original already... Selexa came out of, I think, private money. But but if you actually look at the current machines that Illumina sells, there's a number of technologies that were acquired and cobbled together to help refine the original technologies. So I think NHGRI fingerprints are on the can be found in places on the current instrumentation. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's true. So back to 2003, you've you've fulfilled your goal. <laughs> so we you have this grand got next a vision. New plan. And this means then setting up uh, in a similar fashion, perhaps, to the Genome Project teams uh, that can accomplish this next round of uh, goals that are sort of big science and that are somewhat top down, but you're encouraging all of the participants to come at this in the most creative way and invent new ideas and technologies as they go. And that's wonderful to watch that emerge, uh, whether it's ENCODE or the HapMap project or knockout mice uh, for every single uh, genetic locus. Uh, all of those assemble together with some support and begin to go and take a lot of my time. So I found the time I spent between 2003 and 2008 was not that different than what I had spent in the previous five years. A lot of it was being sort of a project manager for very large uh, projects with excellent staff and so much credit should be given to people like Mark Geyer and Jane Peterson and Jeff Schloss and Elaine uh, is Jane, still, uh, Jane is now uh, running the Keystone uh, meetings. She's, Keystone? She's Chief the, Scientific Officer for the Keystone Symposium. Okay. Yeah, just moved there a couple months ago. So How old I is she? A great uh, team 65? to work in. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Well, maybe more? No, not more. I don't think that <laughs> So that was great fun. But after a while, I kind of felt like I've done this. I've been doing this for 15 years. It's uh, time to think about doing something else but I didn't know what it was going to be. So hence, May 2008 decided, OK, guys, uh, three months more, and I'm going to step away into the white space. And I don't know what that's going to look like. I want to write a book about personalized medicine. And I can't do that as a federal employee, at least not if I want to ever get a dime of royalties out of it, because that would be a conflict of interest. So if I'm going to write a book, i got to quit my job. And I really wanted to write the book. So had the rules done. changed between book one and book two? Well, see, book one was not about personalized medicine. Book one was about science and faith, which was not considered to be part of my official duties. So I could write that book without it being a conflict. Do you define personalized medicine as starting with your genome? It's in there, but it's not all that's in there. It's genome, it's your environmental exposures, uh, it's your lifestyle, it's the whole package. Yeah, but... Uh... The genome gives a reference. A very critical one. Probably the most sort of fundamental reference that I can imagine. Yeah, that's what. But I, this is why I think, uh, I'll just argue, you've got to get more genetics in the medical schools, and not just in terms of research projects, but real practical as part of medical practice. Mm -hmm. I'm and, with you. Well, so maybe both of you could actually comment on that, because you, you're at UNC and Michigan for part of your training. Eric, you're at one of the places that's one of the ground points of ground zero for medical genetics and certainly the medical technologies in your career. So maybe you guys could talk a little bit about medical education and what was unusual about your backgrounds that suited you to your later career compared to what mm. you would have gotten if you'd been at other places. 
Well, I think Eric and I probably caught the fever early of seeing how this fundamental science of genetics was the way that you were going to really understand answers to all these mysteries about disease. And how could you not get compelled by that? But most people don't catch that fever and they get channeled into other sort of more traditional ways of approaching medicine or at least ways that are not tapping into this. And medical education is pathetically slow uh, in changing curricula uh, and emphasis. And uh, it's very frustrating. You know, back, uh, what, 15 years ago, uh, I helped form this thing called the National Coalition for Health Professional Education in Genetics, NICHPEG. We were going to solve this problem because it was so compelling and so much need was out there. And we couldn't get traction with any of the major physician societies. They just didn't see that this measured up on their list of things they needed to know more about. And that's still where we are. It's very troubling. I mean, these challenges really are around genomics are, are quite new. I mean, the story I like to tell is I graduated medical school and graduate school with my MD, PhD in 1987. And 1987 was when the editorial came out in the inaugural issue of the journal Genomics that told the story about how genomics, the word, was actually sort of created. And that was 1987. I mean, that's why when I think back on my medical school and graduate school, I never heard the word genomics once, nor shy of, because it didn't really <laughs> right. get it didn't put exist. into existence until 1987. So the, when I think back on what I learned in medical school, it was like a two-week elective in medical genetics. I mean, it was so minimal. Um, fast forward to today, and there are some examples of some medical schools that have infused more genomics and genetics in the curriculum, but there's just a few examples, and um, it's not nearly the extent that I think is needed. What is needed is for genomics to emerge as being a central part of the need that a physician must have in order to take care of a patient. And I think most physicians aren't aware that that need has arisen yet, but it's really happening, uh, particularly in the field of cancer. They're not gonna be able to stay away from this space for much longer. And then there will be a deluge of requests uh, for how do we learn about this and give me some decision tools and <clears throat> everything that the average physician needs uh, to become a genomic medicine practitioner. But until that sort of critical moment arises, People are too busy uh, to spend their time learning something that they're not convinced is going to help them with the patient they're seeing right now. So if I'm sensing a theme here, <clears throat> there may be a theme of build it and they will come. Um, and sensing where the puck is moving technologically, scientifically, and is this a characterization of your jobs as the head of this part of NIH, that one of the distinctive themes is you do things big and you do things that are technology intensive and data intensive. And heavily managed. And heavily managed. entail a fair amount of central management right. relative to most I think you got to, though, just get into the medical curriculum and practice more. And I think you only do it by offering them sort of $5 billion each, and they'll do it. So, so talk about your Mendelian centers, because that's right. kind of the model. Part of an example, that would be in the discovery, we have a program now to focus on the remaining two to 4,000 rare disorders where thought a single gene is involved. Um, and we have set up a series of centers, about three of them, to focus on really industrializing the process of going from a remaining example of a disease for which we don't yet know the genomic basis to getting in sequencing patients, analyze the data, and quickly getting the information out. That's more on the discovery side. I think on the more applied side, which I think is also what Jim is implying, we have set up also a series of exploratory centers to look at what is it like to take genome sequencing out for yeah, a test Yeah, but right I, I the regard the So Congress, you know, I spend a lot of time now as the NIH director uh, talking to Congress. Uh, in fact, I'm going to have to go in about five minutes to go downtown and talk to Congress. Uh, I've met probably 300 members of the current Congress uh, in the current term, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, just to talk about medical research and the exciting ways that that's changing things. Yeah. Oh, you want to un... Oh, I think we're... We've done our job. <laughs> Jim is declaring. Yeah, well, yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not speaking too publicly. I'm just giving my own... Uh, because I was the big fighter of comprehensive cancer centers. That's why Ben Schmidt fired me in several, uh, 74. I said we didn't know enough to actually deliver any medicine on the basis. But I think we are reaching the point where we really can deliver something to the public. 
That's and right. ironically, a lot of it's in cancer now too, Jim, because <laughs> that's maybe the place where we are most actionable. I mean, if I had cancer today, you think I don't want to get oh my, my tumor God. genome sequence? Yeah, I was darn sure I do. Yeah, but the chief value would be to learn that you have a rash gene, in which case you just don't take any medicine. <laughs> right now, we need to fix that too. <laughs> no, then, uh, but I, could, you know, I, but I actually want to hear much for what you find. Well, you can if you're in that uh, 25, 30 percent where you have an actionable mutation, you have an EGFR, you have an ALK. Uh, yeah, but we don't. ALK, I know. Maybe ALK. And, uh, Jim, I, I would, do I would I like so just we'll, we'll just declare still, this as the informal end, but yeah. I do want to hear. Oh. I want to hear about the changes in congressional relations, and I actually want to hear your perspective. He could. On he this. has to go. So, okay, yeah. that's fine. But let's hear his. But I can also answer. You know, I think medical research, whether it's genomics, <clears throat> whether it's heart disease research, whether it's Alzheimer's, is incredibly compelling story, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or whatever. This is something that you have to care about. And so I have no problems, I think, when I meet, meet with a member, convincing them that this is one of the most critical things that a government can do is to support research. And it's not something that just the private sector alone can do. They get that, that this is an ecosystem where you need the basic and you need the applied and you need all these partners to work together. So I don't have a problem convincing congressional leaders about the value. The problem right now is that we're at this gridlock of making any decisions about what's in the discretionary budget, which happens to include NIH and everything we're talking about. And until that gridlock gets resolved, uh, we're stuck as, as an innocent bystander with gradual erosion of all of the capabilities that were built up over the doubling and which have now, many of them, been lost over the last 12 years now with more than 20% of our purchasing power going away. I don't think we lack for congressional enthusiasm. We just lack for congressional fiscal decision making. So one other counterfactual that I just wanted to ask about is if, I mean, so the, the Human Genome Project got launched at a time when budgets were incrementally increasing year by year. Um, and would it even happen in the current environment? If the idea of the Human Genome Project came along in 2014, would something similar? It would be a hard sell because of the fact that budgets everywhere are either frozen or going down and to argue for starting something new. We're trying to do that uh, with the Brain Initiative. I don't know how it's going to go. I think it's a compelling scientific opportunity, but will it be possible in the face of declining support for everything in medical research because of this gridlock? I don't know.